got to say this morning. Well, this morning we're going to wrap up our three-part series. We've been doing honor, uh, honor, uh, the way of the kingdom. This is part three. Uh, we talked about honor last week and the week before. And uh, I have lots more to say, but we're going to wrap it up this morning uh, with part three. And I've only got nine pages of notes, so it shouldn't take too long. <laughs> Quick review, okay? Honor is a core kingdom value, a value of the kingdom. It's a core kingdom value. John chapter 8, 54, Jesus said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me. Second Peter 1, 17, for he received from God the Father, Jesus did, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John chapter 5, verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That's huge, saints. So, you know, we need to, if we honor God, we need to also honor Jesus. We can see that honor is exchanged between our Heavenly Father and Jesus. There's mutual honor exchange. The kingdom core value is to be expressed and demonstrated by everyone who serves and follows Jesus. This is a really powerful verse. John chapter 12, verse 26, this is talking about you. If anyone serves me, Jesus said, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my, serves me him my Father will honor. So God will honor all those that serve Jesus. What an awesome privilege we have, that we have the honor of God bestowed upon us because we've honored his greatest gift that he gave to mankind, which is Jesus. Our relationship with Jesus and God brings honor into a person's life. Mark, God honored your life. You surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus. You turned your back on uh, addiction. And God has empowered you and he's honored you and restored your relationship with your daughter. Not only, not only do you have three years of sobriety, but you've got uh, restored health. You're probably going to live a whole lot longer than you would have if you weren't uh, doing the stuff that you were doing three years ago. Amen? So there's a, you can just see right there, just in that one testimony this morning, how God is honored. Scripture says that God will withhold no good thing from those that love him, saints. Do you believe that this morning? Man, that is so powerful, withhold no good thing. You know, whenever I get into the thing like, oh, I'm not worthy of to receive a blessing from God, and I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and all that kind of stuff, I start talking, wait a second. Wait a second, I'm more than just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not just a worm, you know. I'm not just, I am a son of God. I am a joint heir with Christ. I am a co-laborer with Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, through Christ. I've, he's in, he's in, there's no good thing. It's his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. So why would I want to withhold pleasure from God? If God gets pleasure out of giving us his kingdom, and we don't want it because we don't think we're worthy or whatever, we'll just, we'll just get by anyhow. We'll just navigate through life without the, without the uh, blessings of God. Then what we're doing is we're short-circuiting God's ability to get pleasure. How many of you want to bring pleasure to God? Then you need to receive all of his goodness and implement it into your life and receive of him as much as you can. And you know what you should do with it when you receive it? Give it to others. Give it to others. Because the more you give, the more he'll give to you. In every, in every aspect. In every aspect. This is how honor is defined in the New Testament. Honor means to elevate, to promote, to raise up and lift up another to a higher place. Honor means to elevate, to promote, to raise up and lift up others to a higher place. To attach a high value to someone and prize that person as you would a treasure. When we, when we honor someone in thought and word and action, we are demonstrating and building the culture of honor and we are re releasing on earth as it is in heaven. You know, it's so vitally important, saints. It's such a vitally important part of honor. And, you know, and it's pretty clear in our society, we live in such a dis society of disrespect and dishonor. I mean, everywhere you go, there is not, I mean, the simple cultural things in America where you showed respect to your elders, 
where you didn't talk, talk back to adults, you know, where you showed respect and you, you, you held in high regard political offices, you held high regard others, you know. We, that is totally gone in our culture any longer. There's just, there just is, to, to what seemed, and my, I'm 67 years old, so what seemed to me to be normal growing up, just showing honor and respect to others and using the word sir and ma'am and these kinds of things and showing that, that's gone, man. I, I don't I hardly ever see it. If you do see it, it's somebody who's old school. My age, you know, it's not somebody, it's not people that are, people that are younger. We've lost that, you know. And, and it all begins at parenting. You know, the, the scripture says, in both in Exodus and in the New Testament, it says, honor your mother and your father, for this is the first commandment with promise that it might go well with you, that you might live a long time. In, in Exodus, it says you might live a long time in the land that God has promised to you. He spoke that to the, uh, to the Israelites in the book of Exodus at Mount Sinai prior to them entering into the promised land. It took them 40 years to get there, but, but he, he said, so spoke that to them. So, you know, it's really so vitally important. We're, there's things I read about parenting and things I read about child development and things like that, and I've kind of had like a, like a new thought about it because I have grandkids. Uh, you know, we have two grandchildren now. So it's like I get to be a small part of helping raise those girls. You better believe I'm going to pour as much of Jesus into them as much as I can, as, as every opportunity that I get. You know, that's my, my, my whole purpose and drive is to get, get them. I want my girls to, my granddaughters to come to know the Lord at a young age and love and serve the Lord all the days of their lives. I mean, what better thing could we want for our kids, right? Some of the things I've read, it says that by the time that you reach age four, the child has totally developed his personality. And its, and its value system is, is hugely a part of that person at, at age four. And if you don't get some bad behavior corrected by age four, they're going to carry that on pretty much into the rest of their life. You know? And it's interesting, Kathy went to her 50-year class reunion last night and uh, ran into some kids, kids, you know, we're calling them kids, that she went to high school with that she hasn't seen since, we, since she graduated high school. And she said, she said it, was, it was kind of funny. She said those that were snooty and, and snotty are still snooty and snotty, and those that were down to earth and heart loving were still down to earth and heart loving. It was just a joy to be, a joy to see them. You know, they were reminiscing about eating, mom, eating grandma's pizza, her mom's pizza, and uh, uh, one was, was saying, "What was it? The pizza? And what was the other one? Oh, pies, pies and pizzas." Yeah. One girl said, "Oh, Teresa, Kathy's mom made the best pies." No, she made the best pizza. You know, and they were they were talking about the memories of, of all that. You know. But it, it struck a chord to me when she said that to me last night, that why are they still snooty? They've been snooty since they were 18 when they graduated from high school, and they're still snooty. 60 years later, 50, you know, year, whatever, 50 years later, they're still the way they were because they developed that snootiness probably when they were, before they were four years old. That's why it's so important that we train our children to have a culture of honor. Honor your parents. Why? Because if you honor your parents, then your heart is open to honor, and it's the kingdom principle of honor. You'll be able to step into honoring Jesus and honoring God and honoring the kingdom. You'll be submissive. You'll be humble. You'll be pliable to submit yourself to the lordship of Jesus. You won't be proud and boastful and arrogant, and you'll come to the place where you'll be able to, you'll be able to do that. Then that culture of honor will be inculcated in you as a small child, and you'll be able to carry that culture of honor with you in every relationship that you have. Not just in your parents, but you'll be respectful towards others. You'll be respectful when others aren't being respectful. It'll become a part of you because you've learned honor at a young age. Train up a child in the way that he should go, so that when he gets older, what? He won't depart from it. So you train up a child to honor your parents, honor others, and as, as small jobs. Parents are so, so vitally important. Got to get them at that young age. Oh, they'll grow out of it. No, they're not, not going to grow out of it. Some stuff they don't grow out of. Some stuff they need corrected. Some stuff they need that needs, you know, I was going to say beat out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that. You can't let that go out on, on the airwaves, you know. <laughs> that's part of the problem there, too, in parenting. I'm not going to get into the big thing on parenting here, but that's it. Discipline. You know, uh, you know, just got, you know, we can't discipline kids. We can't control kids. We have to let kids make their own decisions. So you don't make kids to make their own decisions. You better be making their decisions for them until they're smart enough to make their own decisions. So we have this, we, we have this thing of honor that is, it, that is demonstrated at home with, our, with kids first. Uh, and here's some promises from, from this. 
We, Ephesians 6, 3 says, Honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long upon the earth, that it might go well with you. How many of you want it to go well with you? Yeah. How many of you want it to go well with your kids? Then you need to, you know, grandkids. Some of us have old enough to have grandkids. Great grandkids. Mom's got great grandkids. Uh, we want to we wanna teach them to honor so that they'll have a, the best possible life there is to live. That you might live a long time. So that gives you, gives you it's interesting that <clears throat> Apostle Paul said, I would that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There's a prosperity of soul that brings about prosperity in every area of your life, saints. There's a prosperity of soul that will, that will flow out of you and filter out of you into your relationships, whether they're marital relationships or family relationships or neighborhood or workplace, marketplace, whatever the case is. There's, there's, there's that thing that, that comes from us. There's a, uh, so we want that to be that you might live a long time. You know, long life without abundant life is no life. Really isn't, you know. I mean, so what? You lived to be 100 years old. You 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 were blind and ignorant of God. You lived 100 years and you died and you went to hell. So what? I'd rather be 15 years old, know Jesus, and die and go to heaven. Wouldn't that be a better way of spending of 15 years compared to 100 years? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> that you may enter into the promised land. The promised land in the Old Testament was a land that God provided for them with milk and honey and abundance and all those kinds of things that were, that, that were there. The promised land we have now is an abundant life with Jesus here on earth and, of course, heaven. You know, I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I serve Jesus not because I think about heaven. I don't think about heaven much at all about going to, well, I think about heaven when I miss my dad or miss my brother-in-law or some other people that I've loved or, you know, something like that I think about. I'm looking forward to heaven and getting, being reunited with all those folks. But I'm, I'm enjoying the abundant life now. I'm in no hurry to go to heaven. You know, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that I'm, I'm 67 years old. I only have maybe a 30 or 40 or 50 years left of me before I die. <laughs> huh? You with me? Yeah, good, thanks, bro. So, where was I going to go with that? I don't even know. <clears throat> Yes, the abundant life now, saints. I mean, if you're, you know, last week I mentioned the guy I ran into who said he was wishing Jesus would come back at any moment because life was so miserable, you know. That shouldn't be our perspective at all, man. We have a job to do. We have, a, we have the most awesome responsibility and privilege to be salt bearers and light bearers and living water bearers and, and speakers of truth. You know what? It's going to be even more clear. The darker things become around us, the more evident light is. I'm not concerned with all the darkness that's in America. I'm not concerned with all the darkness that's surrounding us at this moment. Because light always wins over darkness, saints. And when you're in the gray area, you get those times when you're driving and you're not sure if you should turn your headlights on or not. Of course, now all the cars, they turn them on automatically, you know, except for the old car I drive. You got I got to turn everything off or the battery's dead when I come out because the wipers will keep on going, the headlights stay on, the radio's playing. I'm all in the car and I said, who's playing the radio? Oh, that's my car. I got to go back and turn all that stuff off, you know, driving an old car. You know, so, but light always wins over darkness. When it's gray, things are gray, you're not sure whether you should have your headlights on or not, right? So when things have been gray in our country, it's kind of like muddled. But now things are pretty clear. The darkness and the light is getting, brought, getting further and further apart. So that's, that's a wonderful opportunity for us to let our light shine among men. There's men who are desiring what we have, guys. You pass by hundreds of people every day on the road, on the, in the grocery store, in the workplace, that would love to have what you have. They're blinded by Satan. They're captivated by sin and darkness. And what they're looking for is a satisfaction of soul, is, is, is the very thing that you have. So we, we need to be conscious of that. We need to be about our master's business. Okay, I want to move into honor and marriage now. When we leave home, we are, we are to continue to practice showing honor and respect, sowing to the Spirit. If we do in our homes, we will be filled with righteousness, joy, and peace in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we leave our parents' home, you know, we cleave to our spouse, we become one. Turn to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. One verse I'm going to look at. 1 Peter 3, 7. This is the Apostle Peter writing to a whole group of churches, a group of uh, believers in Asia, mostly Asia Minor. Husbands, likewise, dwell with your wife, them, as he's talking about your wife, 
with understanding. Look at what it says there. What's it say? Is it on the screen yet? What's the matter? Giving honor to the wife. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Heirs together. I'm going to unpack this a little bit. Heirs together. Joint heirs, co-partners, team members of equal importance and equal value. Husbands, listen to me carefully this morning, please. This is vital. You need to get this. You need to massage this into your spirit. You need a severe, we all need a severe paradigm shift to where we become the husbands that God has called us to. There shouldn't be any striving in a marriage. You're not two posing teams against each other. You're one team. Mutually input. You know, the quarterback and the receiver don't fight. No, they don't. They have to work together in harmony and unison. The receiver has to do what he's supposed to do, and the quarterback has to do what he has supposed to do for that ball to be where it needs to be when the receiver is going to be there for him to get it, for him to score, for him to win the game, right? That much about football I know. All right? So that's the way we should be in our marriage. There's, 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 not, a, there, there's, there's not a striving between the quarterback and the, and the receiver. There's not a striving. There's a harmonious working together and when things don't go right and the ball is missed or the ball's not where it's supposed to be, you know, there might be some tension there about it's your fault, you should have been, you should have ran a little faster, no, you threw it too soon or whatever. But they work that thing out. They work that thing out so it's perfection, so it's a well-oiled machine so that it, time after time after time the thing is happening and you're pushing that ball down the court and you're winning. Down the field, not the court. Wrong, wrong sport. <laughs> so we, we need to have this kind of an idea that we're, that we're joint heirs, we're co-partners, we're team members of equal importance and equal value. Equal importance and equal value. Women, you know, in, um, in American culture years ago, and probably still is to, to some degree in circles effect now, you know, women were to be servants to the men. And they were like, you know, they were like, you couldn't vote until when? 1925, I mean, crazy, you couldn't vote in a Christian country. It was insane. That tells you the, the, the mis... It was, clearly was not a kingdom principle. It's not a biblical principle. And I've heard scriptures twisted and turned. Wives, submit yourselves to husbands as what? As is fitting in the Lord. And there's a whole thing that needs to be unpacked and understood in context of the passage, not just that one verse popped out to make, my, make my wives, you know, cower down to their husbands. Not the case of all. That's not the way of the kingdom. A Christian marriage just changes pronouns. A Christian marriage, you know, there's quite a difference between a Christian marriage and a secular marriage. I wrote a paper, I give it sometimes when folks come to me, want to get married, and they're not believers. They're just a nice church, nice halfway decent guy, hearing me the pastor, you know, cleans up pretty good, and, uh, you know, when they want to get married. So I'll ask them, why do you want to get married in the church? You know, why do you want Christ to be present in your marriage? Is he present in your life now, you know? So I have this paper about the difference between a Christian marriage and a secular marriage. A secular marriage, who's the center of the, of the whole thing? The, the bride primarily, right, and the couple secondarily, you know? But in a Christian marriage, who's front and center in a Christian marriage? Christ. You know, Christ is the center. It's a, you're, you're, you're asking, you're inviting Christ into your marriage, and you're saying, Christ, I want you to be the center. I want a, I want a Jesus-centric marriage. You're the threefold cord that is not easily broken. The spirit of the husband, the spirit of the wife, and the Holy Spirit, all woven together in strong, strong cord that can't be broken. You know, so Jesus is the center of it. The whole marriage ceremony is to express that how Jesus has given his life for the church, that husbands are to give their lives to, to their wives in that same way. So, so the symbolism of, of us being the bride of Christ and Jesus being the groom, and he's going to come and, and take us away. We're going to elope with him one day on the second coming when the trumpet sounds and dead in Christ rise first and those who are alive and remain are cut up into the air to meet with the Lord forever. When that happens, you know, that's, that's us, him coming and to take us away, take, our, take the bride away. So this has to be something that's very intentional in the way we think about our marriages and, and the, way that we, the way that we treat our spouses, both males and females. Pronouns are changed. I becomes we. Me becomes us. Mine becomes ours. You know, you shouldn't have the conversation of, I know some marriages where 
the husband work, has his own checkbook, the wife has their own checkbook, and they come up to some kind of agreement where, okay, you pay the electric, I'll pay the gas, and, and you put in this much, and I put in this much, and we pay, send two checks in for the mortgage, one from each of the checking accounts. What the heck is that? That's not, a, that's not kingdom thinking. You know, there shouldn't be. It's our money. Whether whose ever paycheck it comes in, whatever direct deposit or whatever, it's mutually yours. The law recognizes that because if you decide to, to divorce, what happens? Everything's split in half, right? Yeah, so, I mean, if the law can recognize that, why can't we recognize that? You know, so I think it's a, and, and maybe there's some kind of reason for the way you do your finances. I'm not criticizing your fi the way you do your finances, but you need to examine your heart. Maybe why is it you do the things you do? Because is it a heart issue or it is a, some kind of a fiduciary kind of reason that you do that? You know, think about that. So there, there has to be a sense that, that it's all ours. Husbands should never say, well, I'm the one that makes the money. You're the one that needs to stay home and do the whole cooking, cooking and cleaning. No, you work the money together because if you didn't have a woman taking care of you, you wouldn't be in the shape that you were to be able to work to make the money. So it's our money. It's our house. It's our, you know, it needs, it needs to be that sense. What is that again? You know, this co-partner, this joint heir, this teamwork kind of a thing that goes on. Young people that aren't married, hang, hang in there. You, you can apply this to, to, to all of your relationships. And if you're not married, yet, it's time to learn this. Learn it now. Learn it now, teenagers, before they're all over, over there. But learn it now before you're, then you won't have to call me for marriage counseling. You'll, you'll be able to, you'll be able to get, it, get, off the, get off the ground in a good way. And I'm not saying that so I don't have to do marriage counseling because I just know it's... They still have to do it. Yeah, they still have to do it. Well, they have to go do premarital counseling, yeah. Put them through the ringer then. All competition within a marriage will vanish in the presence of one spirit. A Christian married couple have a oneness of spirit that interweaves two people into a three-chord relationship, husband, wife, and Holy Spirit. When we understand this and function together as one, then we can bring, begin to be more uh, concerned about the well-being of our spouse than our own concerns. When we rejoice, it should produce joy in the other. When one is hurting, the other is hurting. Husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. We should take care of the needs of our spouse at least to the same level that we take care of ourselves. And some of, that's, some of us are pretty sorry in that area, so we actually need to step it up a little better than taking care of. How many of you neglect yourself? Just a few of you, a couple of you, yeah. <clears throat> I had a, we had a pastor's gathering this past Tuesday, our, our local clergy, and three of the guys there, we were just sharing, there was 10 pastors there, and three of the guys talked about how they need to take better care of themselves. One of them just had a 50th birthday and said, I, need, I recognize I've been neglecting myself and I need to lose some weight, get back in shape again. And, and, if, and by me taking better care of myself, I'll be in a better shape to take care of my family and a better shape to take care of my church. Yeah, so we, we gotta take care of ourselves. You gotta get the love of Jesus in you so you can give the love of Jesus to somebody else. Some of us in our marriages, we having a hard time with love because we ha aren't receiving love like we should be on a daily basis going to the, going to the throne and receiving the love of God. He loves us, that's why we love him. He loves us, that's what, get, he pours his love into our hearts, so what? So we can pour his love out of our hearts, you know? So we gotta, we gotta go to, gotta spend some time with Jesus. Spend some time with Jesus, receive his love, so you'll have some love to give away. Team members, co-partners together of the grace life. Boy, is that good, the grace life. Divine favor and influence that is reflected and expressed in every area of life. A life of grace, a grace life, is a life that, is, that begins in the heart. You cannot have a grace life unless you've come to experience the grace of God is, is impacting in our hearts. Because from our hearts flows all the issues of life, right? Most most of the time, we talk about marriage counseling, most of the time when a couple comes in and talks to me, you know, there's discord within the relationship because there's issues in the heart. And we can get those issues, get the heart right, the rest of it kind of straightens out, you know. Not just looking for, you know, you can apply principles of any kind to any a business or whatever and make it successful, but what really, what really fuels it forward and what really gets the job done is when the heart is right. When the heart is right, everything else kind of falls into place, you know, it really does, you know. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All the rest of this stuff will be added to you, you know. So it's a, so it's a matter of getting your heart right, getting your heart in alignment in that. Getting your, getting your heart in, in sync with kingdom principles, this whole kingdom principle of honor that we've been talking about.
Okay, turn to me with me to uh, what we're we going to read here. Yeah, let me see if that's what I want to do. First Peter, one second. Let me get there. It's First Peter in the New or the Old Testament. You guys aren't sure. Somebody's Googling it at this very moment. Someone's speaking in their phone, Googling it. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read those verses 1 through 6. Everybody, I've heard this taught that this is the instructions for the wife only, and the instruction for the husband is just that one verse, verse 7, that we looked at. But we'll, show, we'll see here in a second. That's a misnomer. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, and even some do not obey the word, they without the word may be won by the conduct of their wives. The word conduct means your lifestyle, your, everything about you, not just your behavior. We think about conduct as being behavior, but it's more of a lifestyle. Expression of your lifestyle of following Jesus will win, can win your non-believing uh, spouse. Verse 2, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your uh, adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Here we go, talking about that heart issue. With the incorrupt beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter <clears throat> you are, if you, go, if you do good, and are not afraid with terror. This is one of Pastor Ken's, one of his favorite verses. He tells Linda this, that, you know, that Sarah called, uh, his, called him Lord. And Linda says, that was Abraham. That ain't going to happen to you, buddy. Go do the dishes, you know. <laughs> you say amen or oh my, right, or oh me or something. I, I don't, I'm not going to take the time to unpack that. I will, I, I could, we could, we should. It would take hours to unpack those six verses. But look at verse 7. Husbands, likewise. Likewise what? Likewise, verses 1 through 6. So what he's saying is, is verses 1 through 6 is not just for the women, and verse 7 is just for the men. 1 through 6 is for the men and the women. He's saying, likewise, let your lifestyle, let your conduct, let you have a quiet and respectful spirit. Don't be, out, don't be worried about ordaining, your, or uh, what do you call it, uh, Women with an with a outward peril, you know, we do the muscles, you know, we pump an iron, eat protein power, so we look like a, you know, we look like a guy, you know. Women put on makeup and gold, so they look like a, like a lady, you know. So not, not to give yourself attention to that, but to the other things. You know, as there's testimonies in this room of people that had an unbelieving spouse who through their conduct and through their Christian character and through the love of Jesus that they had, they won their, their my, my, mom is, my mom's one. My dad was a non-believer. My mother, uh, her commitment to Jesus and the, life ch the change that happened within her life won my dad's into the kingdom. You know, there's others. So we have that capability, saints. You've heard me say how many different times that the only Bible some people are going to read is going to be you. The way that you talk, the way that you act, the way that you treat people, the honor and respect you show others, those speaks louder than than any sermon you could preach, a living sermon. The Bible says, that, Scripture says that we're living letters known and read of all men. People look at us and see Jesus, hopefully. They look at us and see something. Hopefully, hopefully they see some Jesus in there. So we see this. Husbands, one, verses 1 through 6 applies for you. But there's more. We have, more, we have a higher responsibility. Not that we have one. We all, we all, husbands and wives, have 1 through 6. But with verse 7, we have this. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, how many of you want to have your prayers be more effective? Yeah. Here's the key to it right here. Here's the key to it right here. Honoring our wife, loving our wife, caring for our wives increases the effectiveness of our prayers. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Which, and the other way around, I mean, if, if you're if you're not doing those things in your marital relationship, then what's happening? Your prayers are not nearly as effective as they were. I'm not saying your, your prayers are not in, not in void, you know, they, they're, they're canceled, but they're not, they're not as effective, that your prayers may not be hindered. There's a hindrance that comes when, we're, when we show dishonor and disrespect. 
So there's this mutual, mutuality. You know, that's not even a word. Mutua, mutual, mutual, mutuality. I'm not saying it properly. properly. It, is a, it is a word, but it doesn't show up on a spell checker because I don't know how to spell it. I spelled it three different ways and it never turned red. So I don't even know how to say it. You already you're, said so, Mutual submission to one another, mutual respect for each other, mutual care for each other. So this thing about us doing the weaker vessel, men, you know, treat your wives as if they were the weaker vessel. They are weaker. They're physically weaker. God's made us physical stronger. I'm sorry, feminists and other you out there is not going like to like this message. You know, men are stronger. And maybe there's a few marriages where the wife's a pretty big girl and the guy's pretty skinny and maybe she's going to beat him arm wrestling, you know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> guys are going to go home and arm wrestle now. I'll get phone calls. You won't believe it. My wife beat me. Some of you guys won't arm wrestle your wife because you know you might get beat, you know. You need to start drinking some protein powder and start working out. So in that regard, we're as if they are the weaker vessel, and which means it's, it, that speaks to us as the protector provider. From the very beginning, Adam was the protector and the provider. <clears throat> Eve was the one that was a nurturer, the one that brought forth life, and she was a nurturer. And we're supposed to be the protector provider. In the very beginning, Adam screwed up. What, to me, what the bigger failure of Adam wasn't eating of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. To me, the bigger fail of Adam was that he failed to protect Eve from the serpent. That was his failure. He failed in his assignment. To be, he was given this gift taken from his rib. God made him a woman, gave him a woman, a gift. And it was his responsibility to take care of this gift that God gave it to him. He was responsible to tend to the garden and you know, all that as well. But he was responsible for taking care of her. And the scripture says when Eve ate, she saw that the fruit was good, good, good to be eaten and all that. She's having this conversation with the serpent and she took the fruit and she turned to Adam who was with her, the scripture says, and gave him to eat. He stood there and watched this discourse between Satan and Eve. He stood there and let her take the fruit didn't even, doesn't say that it was stood there in silence, apparently, because there's no words even spoken. It is, the next words that are spoken is he's blaming God for the gift that he gave her. It's her fault that I ate of the tree. That's the next words that he speaks. So he failed to be the protector provider that, 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 were, that men are called to. That, that's the prototype. That Adam and Eve are the prototype relationship that we're, we can learn from and glean from there. And uh, so we're called to be the protector and provider, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. This weaker vessel, this statement, should not be uh, something that causes a husband to think of himself as better than the wife. This is not a warm and fuzzy statement to make you feel strong and powerful. This statement should call out the protector provider instinct in us. It should give you the motivation to step it up and release. I need, uh, uh, step, step it up and release. I need to make sure everything I do I'm not sure why I wrote that. I need to make sure that everything I do is motivated by my responsibility and duty to defend and to protect, to deposit life and strength as I bestow honor on my wife, to elevate her, to promote her, to raise her up, lift her up uh, to a higher place. Giving honor to your wife is the best thing you can do for yourself. It is, because it will it'll, it'll give you the ability to enter the promised land. You'll receive honor from God. You'll, your prayers will not be hindered. Plus, your marriage will be a whole lot better. Anybody can re relate to this? Anytime, any, most marital conflicts, the, the spark, the fuel behind it is disrespect, dishonor. We don't want to hear what she has to say. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the stronger vessel. I don't want to hear what my wife has to say. You know, how about these terrible words? Shut up. Yeah. What's that saying? Dishonor. That's saying, I'm discounting you. I'm dishonoring you. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't hear, I want to hear what you have to say. You're not valuable. Whatever comes out of your mouth is invaluable. I don't want to hear what, you're gonna have, what you have to say. Lord, help us. Lord, help me. Turn with me to uh, Psalm 
Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, this is the Apostle Paul's letter to the saints at Ephesus. And he has some marital advice here, some marital instructions that he's given. Some of it's parallel to Peter. Maybe Peter plagiarized. I'm not sure who wrote first. I'm, I'm sure Paul wrote first. Peter wrote, uh, I, I can't remember the sequence, the chrono chronology of when the, these letters were written. <clears throat> but some of it parallels. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through, 20 th through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As for the husband, is head of, head of the wife, also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be, in their own, uh, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, men. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That is one of the most sobering passages for me in the scriptures. When I read that, I think about that. I'm supposed to love my wife. I'm supposed to love Kathy the way that Jesus loves me. Amazing. Coming, I don't come anywhere close. I don't even scratch the surface. He loves us unconditionally. He's for us. He's not against us. There is no shame. There is no guilt. There is no condemnation of those who are in Christ. He's with me. He's in me. He's above me. He goes before me. He's imputed to me his righteousness. I'm saying me, this is all the same thing for you. You can put your name in there. You know, all of that. Wow. He believes in me more than I believe in myself. He does. And I'm supposed to be that for Kathy. Help me, Lord. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. Men, we're priests. Every, every man in here, whether you have kids, whether you don't have kids, we're priests to the, high, to the high God. We represent Jesus. We have the ability to speak on his behalf. We have the ability through his word to rescue people out of the kingdom of darkness, to bring people into freedom from lies, deliverance from, you know, multiple people spoke into Mark's life. Uh, when, when Mark first... Uh, started coming around here. I don't know, how, how, how long ago was it you said it? I came to see you in the hospital? Uh, four, or five, four or five years ago, yeah. We got together on a regular basis and he came in and I and tried to help him through his addiction and you know, some one-on-one -on -one stuff and speaking words to him, giving him the word, giving him the Bible. He started reading the Bible, started being, being a self-feeder, you know, digging into the word himself. Jesus wants to, verse 27, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, that she should be holy and without blemish. He's talking about us as the body of the bride of Christ. Verse 28, back to husbands. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, but as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man leaves his father and his mother and joins his wife, joins himself to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That's just showing honor, that she shows honor and respect towards her husband, mutual, this mutual thing that happens here as well. First Corinthians 3, 9. First Corinthians 3, 9 says that we, for we are his laborers, for we are laborers together with God. This is King James. This is King James, because the other word, they, they translate New King James, other translations, they, they take this word husbandry out. And that's the word I want to I want to talk about here in a second. First Corinthians three nine. This is the King James version. For we are labors together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. This word husbandry is a word that is we we've lost the understanding of that, the meaning of that in uh, in, in 
culture of, of our culture today. Uh, this word husbandry and this word husband are very, re they're, they're related words. They're related words in this. A person who's a husbandry is a person who is a caretaker of another person's property. So a person who is a husband, husbandry person is a person who's taking care of a, an, of a vineyard, an orchard, or some kind of agricultural garden uh, farming kind of a thing, taking care of that for someone else. They're not the landowner, they're just a steward, stewarding that which belongs to somebody else. And the husbandry's job is to do everything that he can do possibly to return the greatest fruit possible, uh, greatest return for that land. If it's a vineyard, then he's doing everything that he can, pruning off the dead branches, going around picking off the dead bugs, uh, looking for funguses, you know, make, making whatever, they, whatever level of you know, uh, uh, horticulture kind of stuff that you understand to do that so that you'll have the greatest pr production of grapes, the greatest harvest of grapes. You know, if you're, if you're tending to an orchard, then you're examining closely every tree and making sure there's no pests, there's no diseases, uh, making sure there's no wild animals are going to come and eat your fruit. Anybody, anybody grow a garden and some wild animal comes and takes your stuff? You know, it's like we grow stuff every year and feed it. We do it to feed the neighborhood, not our, not our neighbors, but the deer and the raccoon and the, and the groundhogs, you know, they come and eat all our stuff. But a husbandry's job is to, is to care, to be a steward. That's the word. You know what a steward is? A steward is someone who cares for the, the property of someone else. Husbands, we're stewards. We're called to care for the property that is not our own. We say it's our wife. You know, we say it's our house. It's our car. It's our money. Everything belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that it dwell therein. It all belongs to God. Our job is to be, what are you taking with you when you leave? Nothing. Nothing. So it's not yours, right? If it was yours, you could take it with you, right? So it's not yours. You can't take it with you. It's God's. We've been entrusted as stewards. Uh, uh, men, we are husbandries. Our job for our, for our families, for our wife, for our brothers and our sisters in Christ, our, our extended family, our nieces, nephews, whatever, all these relationships, we're called to steward these relationships. These individuals are the property of God. Your husband, your wife belongs to Jesus. She's been, she has been bought with the precious blood of Christ. She belongs to Jesus. You better take good care of Jesus' property. Those kids are entrusted to you. Those kids are a gift from God. It's our responsibility to care for those kids. Not just our kids, but all the kids that run around here, that leave here at the, you know, after the offering, before I get up here. We're called to that. So we're called to nurture. This, this word, we're supposed to nourish and cherish. We see those two words, nourish and cherish. Husbands, nourish your wives and cherish your wives. The cherish is, a, is, a, is the idea of placing the highest valuable value possible on this person that has been entrusted to you that belongs to Jesus. This daughter of devotion that belongs to Jesus has been trusted to you, and you need to be husband, you need to be a steward of caring for, cherishing her as the most valuable thing that, that, you, that you get to cherish. It's not your possession, it's not your valuable possession, but, it's, you, but you, she's on loan to you. And it's your job to nourish her and cherish her like, a, like you would a, a grapevine or a fruit tree and that you would examine it and take off anything that's hindering it, that you would bring some chicken manure. We've got too, too much manure in some of our marriages. Bring some chicken manure and make that thing and fertilize it so that you have a greater level. You're examining it to see what kind of, if you're really into it and you understand how to do plants and stuff, you can know what, you know, you got different fertilizers, you know, what kind of fertilizer you need to put on it, what kind of, you know, put some bone meal on there, or put some chicken manure on there, or whatever, put some lime on there, soil's too acidic, put some lime on there. So you're doing this, you're, this, the whole purpose is that, and guess what? You're not taking bushel baskets of grapes home, or apples home, it's all going to the master, because you're just a steward. That needs to be the mentality. That's, it needs to be our mentality in our relationships to do that. It's that same thing. We are caring for kids in that same way, raising them up. And, and this whole kingdom culture perspective within marriage actually spills into every relationship that we have, guys. You know, Kathy and I talk about people that come and go all the time. You guys have been here for a long time. You've seen people have come. Thousands and thousands of people have come and gone out of Wildwood Chapel. Next year will be 85 years Wildwood Chapel has been incorporated. 
And there's, you know, there's been, this has been like, I love what Ken says. Ken says, wow, it's a net ministry. It's a net ministry where we, you know, we, people get saved, you know, people get raised up, and then they, they go off in other places, you know. So when people leave, they're part of the family, it hurts, you know. It hurts, and it's like, well, why, you know, we, we do this, like, self-reflection thing. Aren't we good enough that they, they came here for three or four years or whatever, and they left? Or, or aren't we good enough or whatever? And I, you know what? I had to change my perspective because it was painful. It was painful to see people leave. And I had to change it. I said, Lord, I thank you for the awesome privilege it was that you trusted our leadership and the church's leadership to their souls for that two years or that three years that they were here. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the awesome privilege I had to be a, a husbandry, a steward of your possession and impart to them what you've imparted to me and love them the way you've loved me and our whole body embrace them and love them as a family of God. I thank you, Lord, for that awesome privilege of being a part of their life, even if it's as brief as whatever it was. You know, why? Because they're not, this isn't my church. You know, they're not my people. They're God's people. This is his church. Amen? Yeah, I just happen to be the guy. I happen to be the, the chief steward of Wawa Chapel at this moment. That's all. It's my responsibility to care for the people and get the people to care for each other and get us to love each other and try to be a little bit like Jesus, a little bit more like Jesus this week than we were last week. Right? That's what it's all about. Worship team, come on up. Turn to 1 Peter 3.8. I'm going to end with this verse as the worship team's coming up. 1 Peter 3.8. As I said, this, this kingdom principle of husbands taking care of their wives and parents taking care of their children, this is transferable into all of our relationships. All of our relationships, saints. Some of us need to do a serious paradigm shift. Some of you work with a jerk. How many of you work with a jerk? Okay. So you work with a jerk, you know, and... I'm not going to ask you, how many of you live with a jerk? I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> but we need to do a paradigm shift. Instead of thinking, Lord, would you just get this, transfer that guy to another department? Lord, would you let that woman, you know, bless her. Bless her with another job, you know? And bless her out of this place, you know? Instead of praying those kind of prayers, there needs to be a sense, Lord, as your vine dresser, as your husbandry, as your, as your heir of, of the promises of God, Empower me to steward Christian faith to this person, to love this person the way you love them, to, to have a kingdom perspective of this person that you have. Not my perception, but I want your perception of this person, Lord, so that I can move, I can do a shifting of the way that I think and the way that I feel and the way that I respond. It's amazing. If you do that, there'll be a shift in your heart, and the things that really upset you and really pissed you off all of a sudden aren't going to be have the effect upon you any longer, you know? You, they won't have that same impact on you any longer. Look at 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you, that's all of us, finally, all of you, this is after the thing about wives, you know, wives and husbands, finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or riling for riling, but on the contrary, blessing. Know that you are called to this. That you are called to this. You're called to this. You're called to love that jerk. You're called to love that person that irritates you. You're called to love that boss who abuses you and requires 60 hours of work out of, out of you and whatever, all and on and on. You're called to this. Why? that you may inherit a blessing. And when you inherit a blessing, you get to do what? You get to give it away. Whatever you have, you get to give to your descendants, right? You know, so in that same way, we get to inherit a blessing so that we can be a blessing. Turn to somebody and say, I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm called to this. I'm called to live and represent Jesus and express honor to everyone I come in contact with. Let's stand to our feet. Pray with me. Repeat after me. Father God, Father God oh me, oh, me. oh my, oh my. I, need your help. I need your help. 
Come Holy Spirit, massage this message into me, that it becomes a part of me. Holy Spirit, help me in my weaknesses and in my inabilities to be a person of honor, to build a culture of honor in all of my relationships. Lord God, I receive the calling to be a carrier of honor, to be a dispenser of honor. I declare my need of you to empower me to be an agent of honor. Lord Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, in my home, in my family, at my workplace, in our church, for your glory and your honor. Amen. Amen. Praise God.